Hello and a very warm welcome to another edition of Talking Germany, the show where we do just that. And my guest today is a man who has, in recent years, created quite a stir by criticising, in no uncertain terms, Islam, which he has described as a doomed religion. So, here is the German-Egyptian author and commentator Hamid Abdel Samad. Thank you very much for joining us here today on Talking Germany. Now... His views about Islam led to a fatwa being imposed against him, but Hamid al-Abdel Samad is also critical of other faiths, saying, for instance, that religions in general are incompatible with democracy. So it's going to be very interesting to hear what he has to say about the following topics. I converted to knowledge, says Hamid Abdel Samad, who grew up as the son of an imam. Today, however, he's calling for far-reaching reform of Islam. Cross-purposes, Islam doesn't belong to Germany, says Germany's new interior minister. It's a comment that has left many Muslims up in arms. And journey into the heartland. What happens when a Jew and a Muslim set out on a 30,000-kilometre trip around Germany to find out what people really think? Hamid Abdel Samad, let's, let's begin by talking about you and Germany. You came to ge live in Germany for the first time in the 1990s, I think. How old were you at that time? I was 23 years old. 23 years old. So you were a young man and you had... I, I read somewhere that you had an idealised view of... or an idealised image of Germany in your head at the time. Describe for me what that idealised image was. Yeah, the information I got about Germany was from the TV or from literature. And uh, from literature, you think that all Germans are Goethe's and Schiller's and Novales oh. <laughs> and Rilke. <laughs> and um, I saw in the TV very contradictory images of Germany. I saw the peaceful fall of the Berlin Wall, but also the marching neo-Nazis in the streets of Berlin later. So, and I was just asking, I think this is a country, this is a city where a lot is happening uh, right now and history will be made. Mm -hmm. And then I came to Germany, of course, and I figured out that Germany is fighting with the same problems many countries in this world are fighting with, economy and social disbalance and so on. Yeah, I was going to ask you the, uh, about your, your, your view of Germany has certainly modified. Would you say that Germany has become home for you? One of my homes. I, I am at home in three cultures, in Germany, in Japan and in Egypt. Um, and the word home was modified that uh, it's not just a geographical uh, description of where I am, but where I feel comfortable, why, where I can say what I think. So in this sense, Egypt beco became my home again just a few weeks ago on the Tahrir Square. Exactly. You have been back. Let's go right back to the very beginning. Let's go back to your childhood, which was clearly a very tough childhood. There was a lot of violence. Would you say it was a typical childhood for, for, for Egypt? A part of the extreme violence, yes. It's um, a protected childhood, but at the same time, uh, the children are in the, the lowest part of the pyramid of violence and the pyramid of hierarchy uh, in uh, this society. Um, and we didn't have the opportunity to grow up in a normal, healthy condition to learn to think and make our own judgments. But I was taught the Quran by heart and I, had, I, I didn't have any mechanism to defend myself against the uh, dogmas and uh, the societal pressure which was imposed uh, in me. So it is typical in this sense. Mm. I, I've got a quote from you, the, something you once wrote. You said, people are frustrated throughout the Arab world, not just in Egypt, and they don't know what to do with their rage. Is the, is the pyramid of violence that you're talking about the only reason for this rage, or are there many other reasons? There are so many reasons, but of course, it's the energy of a growing generation of young people. I, I would say that... The same reason that led to Al-Qaeda and terrorism 
is that very same reason that led to these uh, uprisings in the Arab world. Young people are growing up, are uh, going through processes of individualization. They are stepping apart from the societal codes and political and religious restrictions, but they are searching for structures, political and societal structures, where they can find fulfillment. And if they don't find this fulfillment, this energy could um, become chaotic and cause the chains of violence that we experience. So okay. I think that terrorism and revolution have the same source. That's it's right. the energy of a frustrated youth. Okay, that's very interesting. And you're talking there about society in the Arab world in general, in Egypt as well. For you, the religion is, the pro is a problem as well. And you say Islam is a doomed religion. Why do you say that? Because Islam could not reach uh, what many other religion has already reached in this modern world, that to step back in the private rooms. Islam is still insisting on political and uh, judicial uh, influence over the society, which could, could cause uh, a believing society t much troubles when it comes to democratization. I differentiate between religion or Islam as a spirituality and Islam as political codes and a political concept. And I say that only the spirituality in the private room has a future and people need that. But the political dimension of Islam was made for the 7th century, not for the 21st century. Okay, okay. And uh, some of what Hamid is talking about has led to this massive upheaval in Egypt. And we're going to talk about a sort of a German angle on that upheaval because Germany has a very well-functioning agency that has the job of collating and making accessible the millions of files put together in East German times by the communist regime's notorious secret police, the Stasi. And the agency is widely viewed as a model for other countries such as perhaps post-transition Egypt. Let's take a closer look. Egypt, early March. Protesters gather outside an Egyptian state security building in Alexandria, demanding that those responsible for human rights abuses under Hosni Mubarak be brought to justice. Then they storm the building. Germany, 20 years ago. The images bear striking similarity. After the fall of the wall, angry citizens storm the headquarters of East Germany's hated secret police, the Stasi. Who were the perpetrators? How did the system work? We hoped we'd find answers in the documents. Thanks to committed citizens like Herbert Seem, for 20 years there's been an archive of Stasi records where people can view their own files. In Egypt, the military regime now controls the documents. Are civil rights activists being supported, or is the new state authority disempowering its citizens? Recently, Tsim was in Egypt to offer his expert advice. But right now, the military and the authorities seem to have little interest in reassessing the legacy of the Mubarak era. In East Germany, it was the Stasi. In Egypt, it was the Mukhabarat. Yeah, which was worse? For the Egyptians, the Mukhabarat. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, basically, it's almost the same everywhere in a system of unfreedom that you have a ruler or a governing system which is not trusting their own people. And this is the beginning of the sickness in a society. If you don't trust your own citizens and you think that you have to know what they even think and mm -hmm. what they say in private to protect this system. And this leads to the political paranoia which makes such a system always getting more cruel and cruel. And the, the, the East German secret police, the Stasi, they were very good at collecting information. They didn't always get it right. They spelt the names wrong and all sorts of funny things like that. But they collected millions and millions of items of information. Were the Egyptian secret police as efficient at collecting information? Yeah, if there is something that was efficient in Egypt, it's uh -huh. the security service. Mm -hmm. That's the only thing that really worked because they were collecting information about every person who once said anything critical about regime or even in his way to say something critical about regime. Artists, writers, thinkers, politicians, foreigners, everybody who is having um, another approach towards the society, if talking about a change, talking about any reforms, was 
under the magnifying glass of uh, the security service. And now we've got this, these contacts, these first tentative contact, contacts between a representative from the Stasi and the Egyptian authorities. Will that help? I hope so. What we need is, of course, to work out this whole story and to try to pur purify not only the people who was uh, kept in these files, but the people who were gathering this information. We need also them as citizens uh, who are free from this history and from this burden and to know uh, maybe some information that the Egyptians until now never knew mm -hmm. about what was going on in Egypt and what talks were taking place. But we should get out of this big brother mentality into a democratic sphere where we discuss the troubles that Egypt has. Egypt has a lot of troubles and we should discuss them openly, not behind closed doors, and figure out how much could we get the help of the supporters of the older regime because we cannot send them to exile. Mm -hmm. So one way in which Germany can certainly help Egypt in its current situation, I'm sure there are many other ways as well. Um, now, here in Germany itself, it's estimated that there are, at, the, at this present time, around four million Muslims living in the country, and there are constant debates about whether or not they get a fair deal and whether or not they really want to integrate into society as a whole. Now, one forum for those discussions is what's called the Islam Conference, but the most recent gathering of this conference was somewhat marred by comments made by Germany's new interior minister, who was quoted as saying the following. This is what he said. To say that Islam belongs to Germany is not a fact supported by history. OK, Hamid, we've, we've, we've discovered that there were a lot of people, uh, some members of the conference here that we heard about in the report, who were very angry about the comments made by the interior minister. Were they right to be angry? I think no, because uh, first of all, it's not the job of the interior minister or even the president of Germany to say if the Islam is a part of Germany or not. The job of politicians is to work for the citizens, whether they have the German nationality or not, who live in this country. So, But when the minister is saying that Islam is not a part of Germany historically, uh, if it's a historian, I can discuss with him about that. And. Um, I would say the Arab-Persian culture influenced Europe in the Middle Ages, but not Islam as a religion. And we have to differentiate between these two. Just like we have to differentiate between Muslims who are living here as citizens and Islam as a religion. And I am tired of Islamizing the integration debate all the time. Both are doing that, the politicians and the Muslim organization. We Let us talk about human beings and their needs. And has less to do with the religion in the first place. That was going to be my very next question, because what you're saying is very sane and sensible about what has been a really frenzied debate here in Germany. And the real question is, the, the other question I asked perhaps in the intro to that report, are Muslims in Germany getting a fair deal? Yes or no? I think many citizens in this country, also German citizens, are not getting a fair deal because politicians tend to turn to symbolic debate instead of talking about the real issues. The problems we are having in Germany, if it's about integration or not, it is education and the labour market and the societal balance. And that's what we need to discuss in the first place and not just inventing phantom discussions. OK. I think, I think on the, again, very sane, very sensible on what has been a, d a debate that's verged on the hysteria sometimes. I think we'll leave it there. We'll, we'll move on to another aspect of what uh, Hamid's been up to in recent times. Uh, the question, what do you do if you want to know what people here in Germany really think? Maybe you go on a 30,000 kilometre trip round the country, and as we've seen, that's precisely what the sometimes controversial Hamid Abdel Samad has done, and his travelling partner was the equally controversial Henrik Broder. They called going on safari in Germany. That's the mosque everybody's talking about. Do you want to stop for a while? It's not bad at first sight. The big window alone is worth it. It fits, it's not kitschy and doesn't look like it's from Riyadh. The Bavarians are a tribe in themselves, aren't they? I've lived in Germany for more than 50 years and never seen anything like this. 
In a second, there will be a collective exertion. Great. We were just at the mosque and we thought it was really lovely. It fits into the area beautifully. You can look inside, that's what's important. No barriers. You can just go in. Catholic churches are open all day so you can go inside and pray. It's like that here too and I think that's very good. Ahmed Abdel Samad conducts the brass band. That was the pinnacle of my career as an immigrant. For me too. I tell you it was better than Ramadan and Yom Kippur put together. Incredible. But you didn't need enough. That's the ultimate test of our integration. <laughs> Ahmed, uh, uh, a very funny piece that I was. Uh, I was just thinking. You you live in Munich. Yeah. yeah. And you're you're thinking in the in the near future of moving to Berlin. I gather. Yeah. But yes. you've been living in big city Germany. Yeah. It, it, when you went out on this trip, you really did go out into small town countryside Germany. What did you learn about the Germans? Yeah, that Germany is more wild than we think. Wild? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because we have, the image, the wild we, we, ha we have the image that Germans are always correct and tidy yeah. and so on, but yeah. they can go wild if they want. And um, I think the more you go to the countryside, I, I thought the opposite, that the tolerance is greater in big cities in Germany. But uh -huh. I started to think that the tolerance is greater in the smaller towns because people still have a stable identity. Mm -hmm. They trust mm -hmm. this identity. Mm -hmm. They are not afraid to lose it. While people in big cities are start to question this identity and they need to yeah, deal, uh, to hygiene this identity or try to clarify it, purify it, which is, could be problematic. Germans are critical uh, about many things and uh, in, in the countryside <laughs> you, you feel a kind of like uh, easygoing life and kind of uh, like uh, self-trust which is uh, not so much in the big cities. Yeah. It's this sense of identity, isn't it? Yeah. Yes. That people really do speak up then and they, they, they say their piece, they want to get involved in conversation with you rather than in the big cities, people can sort of stay away from the issues, yeah, yeah. a little bit. Um, so, you, uh, in that piece again, your long journey that you went on, your safari, it was a Muslim and a Jew going around Germany. Was that a, you know, did that lead to special discoveries or special encounters? Yeah, I mean, this is like, the Germans are always cautious when it comes to this combination because they don't see it very... <laughs> they don't know what to do. They, yeah, they don't see it very often yeah. and uh, historically, Germans have a sensitive position to the Jews and in the current time they have a sensitive position to the Egyptian mm -hmm. and it was sometimes like they get the whole package together mm -hmm. and they have to deal with it and mm -hmm. it was uh, quite tough for many people because they couldn't really like cope with us and we were just very normal and we were asking them questions and letting them like reveal themselves by themselves what they really think when it comes to environmental issues, when it comes to the peace activism and when it comes to the Stasi and mm -hmm. to the Nazi. We met also new Nazis in this trip and it was a very funny <laughs> You sat down and chatted about the world to neo-Nazis. To neo-Nazis mm -hmm. and they were just standing there and looking to us as two people who are coming from planet Mars or something. Yeah. Yeah. Very interesting observations. Uh, just, you, you, you've, you've been living in Germany for what, 15, 16, 17 years? 15, yeah, 16, yeah, okay. And you've got a German passport? Yes. A yes or no answer? Yeah? yeah. Are you a patriot? A German patriot? No. No. <laughs> no, that's for a yes or no answer. That's what I got. OK. Uh, if you've enjoyed the show today, the discussion we've been having, and you want to find out a little bit more about my guests, then you might want to uh, read my blog on the Talking Germany website. And do please post your comments. If you're into Talking Germany, you can find out more on the internet. Your host, Peter Craven, is keeping a blog on the many shows and guests in the series. Find out more about what happens behind the scenes, gossip, experiences, how the whole show is put together. Just visit blog.dw-world.de slash Talking Germany. And you can tell us what you think about the program there, too. OK, we're drawing to the end of the uh, show, Hamid, and we uh, traditionally have our quiz at the end of the show, so I'm going to give you some sort of alternatives, perhaps, yeah? Uh, we talked about Munich or Berlin. Which is the better city for you, for living in? 
Berlin. Berlin, yeah. Or Cairo? Cairo. <laughs> <laughs> uh, faith or knowledge? Knowledge, definitely. Uh, democracy is coming to the Arab world, yes or no? Yes. Yes. Yeah? No ifs or buts there. Islam is part of Germany, yes or no? Not yet. Not yet, but you're confident that it will be. I can sense. Um, life is harmony or life is conflict? Life is a conflict and harmony. Germany is home or are you still in transit? Transit. Oh! <laughs> it's been a good guest, hasn't it? It's been very interesting listening to what he has to say today. Uh, if you've enjoyed his company as much as I have, then do come back next week. Thanks for joining us.